Well, aloha everyone, and welcome to Anatomy 151 here at Chaminade University. This will serve as a lecture for Unit 1, an overview and an introduction to anatomy. So while we will be looking at an overview for the chapter, we will also be looking at an overview both for this semester and for next semester, as we're going to get an outline of all of the different systems that we're going to touch on in both Anatomy 1 and also Anatomy 2. The purpose of the chapter is to introduce the idea of the disciplines of anatomy and physiology, their similarities, their differences, their interrelatedness, and also discuss the organization of the human body as a whole, and talk about living things and their shared properties, and last but not least, we're going to touch on the concept of homeostasis. And you're going to hear the word homeostasis many, many times throughout this semester. So we're going to talk about feedback loops and how we are able to control homeostasis. Now, anatomy and physiology work hand in hand. So anatomy is the study of the structures in the body, whereas physiology is the study of how those body structures actually function and their interrelatedness with other body structures. Now we have multiple levels of structural organization of the body system. We have many tiers of complexity. The very lowest level of complexity is the chemical level, and we'll have an entire chapter on atoms and how they interact together to make molecules and how those molecules end up running our whole system, basically. Um, and then if you get those chemicals together and you get them a little bit more complex, we end up making something called a cell. Now a cell is the smallest unit of life, and it can connect with other cells, particularly multicellular organisms like ourselves, to create tissues. And tissues come together to make organs, organs make organ systems, and then organ systems make organisms. So each of these individual pieces is so much smaller than what it becomes as a whole. So basically the whole is more than the sum of the parts. All right, so these are the 11 major systems of the human body, and we're going to touch on these both in this semester, 151, and also in the next semester in 152. The first system is the Inkitberry system, and that's going to be comprised of the skin, the hair, fingernails, and toenails, also sweat glands and oil glands. The purpose of this system is to help protect the body and regulate body temperature. It also is going to help secrete some waste. It is going to make vitamin D, which is converted from sunlight, and also has a bunch of tactile receptors, so it's going to help detect sensations, things like touch, pain, warmth, cold, and last but not least, just underneath the skin, we're going to have an area where we're going to store fat to help provide for insulation. The next system of the human body that we're going to talk about is the skeletal system. It's going to comprise all of the bones and the joints of the body and all the cartilages associated with them. The functions are obviously for structural support, so it's going to help support and protect the body. It's also going to provide area for muscle attachment, so muscles are meant to move bones and that's what moves the body, so that's going to help aid with body motion. Um, also, it's going to be responsible for housing very specialized cell types that are going to help produce our blood and store minerals like calcium and also store things like lipids and fats. The next system that we're going to talk about is the muscular system. Specifically, we're going to talk about skeletal muscle, but we have other types of muscle as well, um, including smooth muscle and cardiac. Um, skeletal muscle is specific to muscle that is attached to bones, so therefore a muscle that moves the skeleton. And the functions of skeletal muscle is going to be body motion, right? It's going to help you with things such as walking and maintaining your posture. And it also is going to help produce heat as well. So muscles are going to help create the human body heat. The next system that we will be talking about is the nervous system. Major components include the brain, spinal cord, nerves, as well as sensory organs, such as your eyes and your ears, and they're going to get their own specialized chapter. The functions of the nervous system is basically to help regulate your body activities, and it does that by creating something called an action potential, or you may know it as a nerve impulse. But it also has sensors and receptors that help detect changes in the body's internal and external environments, um, and then interprets those changes in response. We talked about homeostasis. So if something ends up too far out of its physiological norm, we want to help revert it back to those physiological conditions that are homeostatic, and so we're going to have to interpret the changes and then respond, and we can do this in many different ways. Sometimes we'll do that by muscular contractions or secretion of glands or hormonal regulation, etc. The next system is the endocrine system, speaking of hormones. The endocrine system is comprised of hormone-producing glands, and there's many of them, and we'll talk about them independently when we get to the system. But they include things like the pineal gland, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the thymus, the thyroid, the parathyroid, the adrenals, the pancreas, and then the ovaries and the testes. So any hormone-producing cells, basically, and these are going to be spread out throughout the body in multiple different organs as well. 
And the function of the endocrine system is going to help regulate the body activity. Again, it does that by hormonal release. Hormones are these small little messengers, they're chemicals that get moved around the body and they go from the endocrine gland to the secretory organ to whatever their target organ or tissue is. And then they have a, an impact on that target organ or tissue. The next thing that we're going to talk about is the cardiovascular system. This is going to be your entire circulatory system, including your blood, your heart, and your blood vessels. The function of this is for your blood to move from your heart through your lungs to the rest of your body. So it's going to help circulate oxygen and nutrients to the cells. It's going to remove waste like carbon dioxide and other cellular waste. It helps regulate our acidity, so our acid-base balance. We, again, we want to maintain homeostatic conditions, and one of the things that we want to maintain in physiological norm is our pH. Another thing is temperature, and then last but not least, the water content of our bodily fluids. Again, these are all things that we need to maintain in relevant homeostatic conditions. Next, we'll talk about the lymphatic system and its role in immunity. The components of the lymphatic system include the spleen, the thymus, the lymph nodes, and the tonsils, as well as all the lymphatic fluid and the vessels that are going to carry that lymphatic fluid throughout um, the entire body. We have specialized cells inside the lymphatic system that carry out the immune response. Again, this is going to get its own chapter. That includes B cells, T cells, and many others. And the function of the lymphatic system is basically to be able to return proteins and fluid back to the blood and also pick up lipids from the gastrointestinal tract. So lipids are going to be unable to be immediately digested directly into the blood, so they have to go through a specialized route. Um, and it also has specialized sites of maturation and proliferation of those cells that we just talked about, B cells and T cells, which are involved in immunity, so they're going to help protect us against disease-causing microbes. We'll also spend a chapter talking about the respiratory system. The respiratory system is going to start with your air passages coming through your mouth, so the pharynx and the, the throat, right, the larynx, um, then down through the trachea and the bronchial tubes into the lungs. And the function of this is going to be gas exchange. It's bringing in oxygen from the inhaled air into the blood and exporting the carbon dioxide from the blood into the exhaled air. Also going to be involved along with the circulatory system and regulating the acid-base balance. Again, homeostatic conditions must be maintained at all times of our different bodily fluids, mainly our blood. And it's also going to be involved in talking, right? So the air that comes out of our lungs goes across the vocal cords, which is going to be found in the larynx, and that's going to help produce sound. We'll also spend a chapter talking about the digestive system. The digestive system has multiple components, all of the organs of the gastrointestinal tract. It's basically a long tube that stretches from mouth to anus, and it's going to include the mouth, the pharynx, the esophagus, the intestines, including the small and the large intestines, I apologize, I missed the stomach, small and large intestines, and then out through the anus. Also include multiple accessory organs that are going to have multiple different roles in the digestive process. That's going to include things like the salivary glands, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. And the overall role of the digestive system is that it's going to break down your food. So both physically by what we call mastication and churning throughout the digestive tract and also chemical breakdown where we have different enzymes that are going to help digest. And also we're going to be absorbing our nutrients through our intestines. And finally, elimination of anything that doesn't get digested. So all undigested material is eliminated in the form of solid waste. Next, we'll talk about the urinary system. So while we were just talking about defecation, now we're going to talk about the creation and elimination of urine. Um, that's going to include the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra. And again, the overall function is going to be create, store, and eliminate urine, also eliminating other waste within that urine, and regulating the volume and the chemical composition of the blood. At the same time, it's also going to play a role in the acid-base balance of the bodily fluids, such as the blood, etc., and helps maintain the body's mineral balance as well. It's also going to be involved in helping produce the red blood cells. So the urinary system has a lot of different roles. Last but not least, we'll be talking about the reproductive system. The reproductive system is going to include the gonads, so that's going to be the actual male and female reproductive organs, such as the testes and the ovaries, but also many um, associated organs, such as the um, uterine tubes and the uterus, the vagina, mammary glands and females, and the male will talk about the epididymis, the ductus vas deferens, um, seminal vesicles, prostate and penis, and we'll talk about all of those different organs and their role in reproduction when we get to that chapter. The overall function of this is to be able to reproduce, right? So we have different gonads in the male and in the female that each produce gametes. In the male, they produce sperm. In the female, they produce eggs or oocytes. And these guys are going to combine to form a new organism that's going to be genetically unique from either mom or dad. 
But there's other roles for this reproductive system, right? It's also going to help store the gametes, and it's also in the female, we're making milk from the mammary gland. So it's not just creating the offspring, it's going to be nurturing the offspring as well. All right, so we're just going to take a second here to talk about some of the non-invasive diagnostic techniques that I'll be talking about throughout, um, throughout this class. So there are some things that you can do simply by, for example, touching, right? Palpitation, auscultation, percussion. These are different ways that they're able to assess aspects of body structure and function, and these are going to be able to determine if they are normal or pathological. Um, all human, all living things, including humans, um, have different characteristics that are going to distinguish them from non-living things. And those major characteristics are going to include something like metabolism, which is basically the creation and the breakdown of all of your different biomolecules inside your body. Um, your responsiveness to things like light and, mo and motion surrounding you. Um, your ability to move and, gr and grow, reproduce, right, and differentiate, and reproduction. Now, an autopsy is something you might hear me refer to about, I want to say something about post-mortem. So it's basically after an individual has died, we take a post-mortem examination of the body to determine or confirm what we may already believe to be true, the cause of death. And this is when we'll see certain pathological conditions. So sometimes you may see something that's a, um, a normal versus a smoking lung, for example, or a liver with cirrhosis and a non-diseased liver. And when you see the... the organ that is damaged, it's going to be determined to be pathological. And then we can talk about the different types of pathology, so things can go wrong in various ways. Again, you're going to hear me mention homeostasis a hundred thousand times this semester. And homeostasis basically means that we are meeting equilibrium or balance. And there's so many different parameters inside the body's internal environment that we have to maintain in that equilibrium that homeostasis can refer to any of those parameters. But the objective is to maintain homeostasis by regulatory processes. And this is really important because our body cells only work within specific parameters. And so the survival of our body cells, and therefore our body itself, is going to be dependent on regulating the chemical composition of both the inside and the outside. Um, the fluid that is outside the cell is called extracellular fluid. The fluid that is inside the cell is called intracellular fluid. And this is a feedback loop, and you're going to see this over and over throughout this semester as well. So any time that homeostasis is disrupted, usually it's going to cause by some sort of external stimulus, or it could come from an um, a me error in metabolism inside the individual as well, but it's going to disrupt a controlled condition. And there's a lot of different types of con controlled conditions. That could be temperature, it could be pH, it could be um, salinity, or calcium concentration, or the blood pressure, right? So there's so many different things that need to be controlled inside the human body at any given moment, and each of them are monitored by specific receptors. So when a receptor gets input or information that says, hey, we are out of whack, so homeostasis is disrupted, this controlled condition is either up or down, and we need to get it back to normal, that's going to send information to a control center. Now, generally, the control center is going to be the brain. Um, there's different regions of the brain that control, but there's also going to be um, different places that might be hormonal secretion. So we might talk about something released from the adrenal gland or something like that. Um, and that control center is going to then affect something downstream. So the control center is going to send nerve impulses or some sort of chemical signal, signal to an effector tissue that brings about a change to bring the control condition back to normal so that we have a return to homeostasis. And when we return to homeostasis and the control condition is normal, generally all of these parameters are going to return back to normal conditions as well. Okay, so what does that look like? Here's an example. But again, you're going to see this so many different times that you're going to get so tired of me walking you through it. Um, but you'll be very familiar by this type of diagram by the end of this um, series of semesters. So basically a stimulus, in this case, is going to, again, always disrupt homeostasis. In this case, the controlled condition that we're talking about is blood pressure. So if we have a decrease or increase in blood pressure, there is these special receptors, they're called baroreceptors, and they're found in certain blood vessels. We'll talk specifically about where they are found, in, they, but they are found in specific parts of the circulatory system, and they measure the blood pressure. And if blood pressure gets too high or falls, then that input gets sent by nerve impulses to the control center. Again, it's usually going to be the brain, not always, but generally going to be the brain. And the output from that is going to be in the form of nerve impulses. Sometimes it's going to be in the form of a chemical release, though, so sometimes you might see this as a hormonal release of something. Um, but either way, that is going to have an effector tissue. In this case, the effectors are the heart and the blood vessels. So if we have an increase of our blood pressure, 
then the response all the way down here on the effectors is going to be a decrease in heart rate. And we do that by two different things. We decrease the heart rate. Uh, sorry, we're going to decrease blood pressure in two ways. By decreasing the heart rate and also by dilation or widening of the blood vessels, which is going to cause a decrease in blood pressure. And once we end up returning back to homeostasis and the controlled condition is back to normal, then these effectors are going to stop relaying that signal to the control center and the effectors are going to then end up not having the effect on the affected tissue. Okay, so this is an example of negative feedback. Most of the examples that we'll talk about throughout the semester are going to be negative feedback. There are very, very slim um, examples of positive feedback, but I'll talk about one right here. So an example of positive feedback is generally when we are trying to achieve a goal. So we're not trying to necessarily maintain a homeostatic condition. In this case, we're trying to expel a fetus. So we're trying to maintain a specific goal, and then once that goal has been achieved, um, then we're going to end up back to the normal condition. So let me walk you through this. Here we have contractions of the wall of the uterus is going to push the baby's head into the cervix. When we have a push into the cervix, that's going to increase the normally controlled condition, causing a stretching of the cervix. Now normally when we saw the negative feedback, what we would do is we would want to end up, so with stretching, we want to bring it back to normal. In this case, we want to stretch it some more in a positive feedback loop. So in this case, we have receptors that notice that we have the stretching there in the specific region of the cervix. And those send nerve impulses to the control center of the brain which then releases oxytocin, which affects the muscles in the wall of the uterus. Well, as you can see, the wall of the uterus is what was causing to begin with, right, pushing the baby's body down. So that's going to contract more forcefully, and the bobby, baby's body is going to stretch the cervix even more. And we're going to do this over and over, lather, rinse, repeat. Stretching causes more stretching, causes more stretching, until eventually we interrupt the cycle, in this case, the birth of the baby. That's going to break the positive feedback cycle, and conditions are going to return to normal. All right, but generally what you're going to see are going to be what I just showed you in terms of negative feedback loops. However, anytime homeostasis is disrupted, we have to bring it back into the parameters or else we can end up with disease, disorder, and eventually even death. So it's really important that we maintain homeostasis. And if we have a homeostatic imbalance and we know we can treat it, then we can just treat it by adding extra pills to our diet, for example, medicines or insulin, etc. Um, but if we have something that we need to control and we're unable to get it under control, we can end up with pathological conditions, again, diseases or disorders. All right, so for the little bit, for the next few slides, we're going to talk about anatomical terminology. We'll talk about body positions, so which direction they're facing, regional names, so the different regions of the body, directional terms, planes and sections, and body cavities. And this is all going to be very important so that you have a relative idea about what we're talking about directionally when we're talking about different regions of the body. So when I refer to anatomical position, this is basically a standardized method of absorbing, of observing, sorry, or imaging the body that's going to be precise and allow us to have a reference point. So everyone is going to have the same consistent anatomical reference based on this anatomical positioning. And anatomical positioning is basically if you're standing straight up, erect, facing the mirror or the observer, and your extremities are placed down at your sides and the palms are turned forward. So your hands are going to go forward and your feet are flat on the floor. That's going to look like this. Okay. Um, so that, again, is going to be your normal anatomical positioning from the front and from the back. You can see at the back we're going to see the back of her hands, and the front we're going to see the front of her hands. Now, I'm not going to walk you through each and every one of these, um, but I'm going to walk you through the multiple regions that we might refer to. So the cephalic region is going to be the head, right? The cephalus means head. And you'll see that when we talk about development, too, anytime you, or if you talk about pathology, here's hydrocephalus, that's water in the head, right? Water in the brain, or anencephaly, very small, missing brain. Um, so cephalic region is the head region. It's going to include the cranium and the facial region. In the facial region, we have multiple different sections. We will go over these specifically when we talk about bones, but it's going to include like the forehead or the frontal region. The temporal region is by the temple, ocular region or orbital region around the eye, otic meaning ear, and you'll hear otic for ear multiple different times. Again, the otic bud is going to be the region that becomes the ear in the developing embryo. Uh, buccal region is the cheek, nasal nose, oral mouth, and mental chin. We next will have the cervical region. It's going to include the cervical vertebrae. Um, and then after that, we're going to have the trunk. The trunk is going to be the centralized region here that's going to go from the cervix down to the pelvis. From the pelvis, we're going to have the lower limbs. Um, and then out from the shoulders, we have what's called the upper limbs. Right? Um, so inside the trunk, we have three major regions. The thoracic, that's the chest. Um, the abdominal, that's the abdomen. And the pelvic, which is the pelvis re region. 
Here on the upper limb region, we're going to have the, um, the axillary or the armpit going out into the brachial, which is the arm. The antecubital does that little divot in the front of your elbow. So if you hyperextend it out, it's still going to be divoted in. That's your antecubital, which should be in normal conditions. Um, the antebrachial is the region that's in front of the forearm, basically. Carpal, you've heard of carpal tunnel syndrome, right? Carpals are going to be your wrist bones. And then as we head out, we have the palmar region and the digital region of the hands. I'm going to travel down the legs now. As we travel down the legs, first we're going to reach the inguinal region, right? The ingu inguinal region is going to be that inguinal canal here. It's going to be basically just between the pelvis and the, the femoral region or the thigh. Um, then the crural region, crural is how you say that. That's the leg region, which is going to head down into the tarsal. So that's the ankle. So tarsal is the equivalent in the in the leg as carpal is in the arm. It's the ankle to the wrist, basically. Um, and then the bottom region is the pedal region or the foot region, which is going to include digits as well. Let's see, what have I missed? Okay, so from the back, the occipital region is the very base of the skull. And if you were to run your fingers along your skull line right now, you can feel there's a little dent right there as your skull actually connects to the top of your cervical vertebrae. That's going to be the occipital region, the very base of the skull, which connects down into the cervical region of the neck, of course. And then if we're looking at the back parts of the trunk, we have the scapular region, which is our shoulder blade. That's called the scapula. Um, the vertebral column, which is the spinal column. Oh, this is the back of the elbow. This is actually part of the limbs. Obviously, that's the olecranal region, which is the opposite of the antecubital region in the elbow. Again, following down the back, we have the lumbar region or the loin region. We get the sacral region, which is right between the hips. Um, that's where people break their their um, their coccyx. It's going to be right there. It's at the very low, right beneath the sacral region. Um, gluteal region and gluteus maximus is the buttocks region. Um, and then the papal teal is the hollow region behind the knee. Um, this here is the uh, perineal region, which is the region of your external genitalia. As we follow down the leg, again, the papal teal, back of the knee. Uh, the sural region is called the calf. And then the plantar, we've heard of plantar warts, on the sole of the foot. Um, let's see, what else did I miss? Okay, so in the trunk region, I guess I missed this. This is the mammary region, which is where the woman's breast would be, or for the man, this is just going to be your normal chest tissue, um, uh, pectoral tissue. And then here, umbilical region is going to be where your navel is connected. This is what was sustaining you as a, a, your life, which has connected you to your mother when you were in utero and then was no longer necessary once you took your first breath. That's where your umbilical cord would have been connected. Um, this region is the coxal region, and then this here is the inguinal region, again, the groin. All right, so I, I lied to you. I actually did go through all of it, but you'll go through all of it again when we get to this chapter. Um, some of the directional terms that we can talk about um, are going to be how things are located relative to one another. So if you were to consider that this is the midline, right, straight down your throat, down your chest, your sternum, um, down through your groin, anything that is headed away from that middle, um, medial region is called lateral. So as you're headed out, it's called lateral. If you're headed towards it, it's called medial. If you were to have your arms out, going towards your wrist would be distal, going towards your shoulder would be proximal, so proximal means closer, distal means further away. Um, and just orienting you from your head to your feet, the, your head would be superior to anything to your feet. So um, this is one of those orientations that's going to um, change in something like a cat which walks on all fours versus a human which walks on um, two feet. So superior just means towards the ceiling really, not necessarily towards the head. Now we have planes in which we can basically divide the body in these imaginary flat surfaces. So we're going to bisect the body in one plane or another. So if, for example, I were to just take a scalpel or a razor blade and dissect right through here, right through the halfway part of her body, that's the transverse plane, this direction. Okay? Um, a frontal plane would be if we were to take this, this right here and just take a razor blade like a guillotine straight through the body from head to toe. Um, this being the mid-sagittal line, so in the middle of the body, it would be a mid-sagittal plane straight through the midline. If it's a little bit off, but it's the same direction, it would be parasagittal. So picture this going through like the clavicle or the shoulder blade, I'm sorry, the collarbone, right, and the scapula with the shoulder blade in the back and then straight through the mammary tissue and then through, say, the knee and the foot. That would be the parasagittal plane. And then anytime you have a plane that's not exactly um, in line with the others, that's called an oblique plane. So an oblique plane has a little bit of flexibility. It's not a traditional plane. 
And it's really important to keep these in mind when you're looking at things like tissue, right? Particularly when you're looking at histological samples um, under a microscope because depending on which direction they section something, it can look entirely different. So if you were shown this picture versus this picture versus this picture and you didn't have any scientific knowledge, you would say that they were totally different types of brains. But really it's the same brain dissected in different ways. So here's a mid-sagittal plane taken straight down the middle and separating the left and right hemisphere. Here's a, um, a frontal plane, which is going to separate the front part of the brain from the rear part of the brain, right? It's going to be called a frontal section. And a transverse section is going to separate the top from the bottom. So depending on which way you slice it, you're going to get completely different images and different viewpoints. So it's very important that you orient yourself before you take a look at whatever sample you're looking at under the slide so that you know which direction you should be expecting things to appear. All right, so in addition to all of these regions and orientations, we have specialized body cavities. And these body cavities are basically areas that are going to help separate and support the internal organs. So they'll keep the um, different parts of the organs anchored and separate from other organs. So the top cavity, if we're just going to start from the head and work our way down, at the very top cavity is the cranial cavity. As you can imagine, this is the cranium. It's formed by the cranial bones. And inside, no, no brainer, it contains a brain. Didn't mean to do that, but I'm funny. Um, anyway, it, it's a really obvious that it is going to have a brain inside this cranial cavity. Um, and then the vertebral canal is going to be where our spinal cord is going to travel down. And it's going to start off wider and get skinnier as we go down. Why? Because nerves are going to branch off. So you can picture this as the highway whereby everybody's getting on one direction and then a very few people are getting off here. Everybody gets off every step. Then we're going to end up getting thinner and thinner as we go down. And you'll see that when you look at the vertebral column, the hole in which the spinal cord passes through gets smaller every vertebrae subsequently as you're headed from head to um, head down to your lumbar region here. The next cavity is the thoracic cavity. The thoracic cavity is going to be your chest cavity. This is where your lungs are going to sit. Also, your heart is going to sit. So it's going to contain your pleural and pericardial cavities and the mediastinum. So the pleural cavity is going to be the area that fills the layers of the pleural that surround the lung. We have another cavity that's the pericardial cavity that's going to be a space between the layers of the pericardium that surround the heart. And then the mediastinum is the area of the central of the thoracic cavity between the lungs. It's going to start from the sternum um, and go through the the vertebral column, and basically from the first rib to the diaphragm. And in here we're going to have the, in the heart, um, the thymus, the esophagus, the trachea, and multiple very large blood vessels. Now, if you picture that these are um, large cavities, and inside these cavities we have other cavities, you can kind of picture that like having a large box, and then inside the box wrapped gifts, right? So even though we have a specific region for the heart, the heart still has its own packaging to keep it separate from things around it. And we need that because something like the heart which is constantly beating, or the lungs, which are constantly expanding and contracting, are going to be in constant motion, and so they're going to have kind of friction, so they're going to need some sort of spacers in between, and that's what the pleural cavity and the pericardial cavity um, provide, a region where the heart and the lungs are able to be able to move a little bit without really causing too much damage on themselves or wear and tear on the surrounding tissue. In this bottom region, we have the abdominopelvic region, which is basically everything you can imagine. It's your abdomen and your pelvis, and it's going to contain your stomach, your spleen, your liver, your gallbladder, your small intestines, and almost all of your large intestines. Um, and then there's a serous membrane of that abdominal cavity, and that's going to be called the peritoneum. Now the pelvic cavity is just underneath the abdominal cavity, and that's going to contain your urinary bladder. The rest of the large intestines, so what is not found in the abdominal cavity, is going to be found in the pelvic cavity and also your internal organs of reproduction. So for the female, it's obviously going to be the cervix and the uterus and the ovaries um, and the vagina. For the male, that's going to include, again, only, ex only internal organs. Um, so for example, the penis and the testes are going to be external organs, but it's going to include things like the prostate and the seminal vesicles, um, etc. All right, so let's talk about the different cavities. So let's talk about the thoracic cavity. The thoracic cavity basically is going to have the pericardium and the pleural regions, and these are going to be, as I mentioned, packaging that covers the heart and the lungs respectively. We'll get extensively into this when we get to those chapters themselves, but this is just kind of an overview. Now again, here's the pleural cavity. It's going to surround the lungs. Um, parieta is going to be the external region. Visceral is going to be the part that touches the lungs itself. So anytime you, you see parietal and visceral, parietal just means outside, visceral means inside. So you'll see that a couple times. Uh, again, example for the pericardium, the par parietal pericardium is the external part. Um, and then the parietal cavity, I'm sorry, the pericardial cavity is here in the center. And the visceral pericardium is going to be internal. Again, parietal outside, visceral inside. 
That's going to be separated from the abdominal section by the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is going to be a muscle that's going to contract downward, that's going to change the volume of the lungs, which is going to bring in air and allow you to take um, a breath. All right, so now we're going to have a little bit of a different orientation, and I think this is just done on purpose so you can see different regions, and also so you can see how different sections might show you different information. So here's a transverse plane, and what that means is that we're going to section right here through the pecs, um, and we're going to have to position ourselves looking down on this individual. I guess you could look up as well, but anyway, this is the anterior region, which is going to be... Um, going to be the front of the body. You can see this is the sternum or the breastplate. The posterior is going to be the rear of the body. And you can see this is the vertebral column or the backbone. And that should be a pretty quick orientation. Anytime you see this kind of shape, um, it's going to vary in size a little bit as it travels up or down the body, but you can pretty much assume that that's going to be the vertebral region, which will be the backbone of the, the individual. Um, here we have the lungs themselves. Here's the right lung and the left lung. So now you can see you are looking downward. Um, uh, you're looking upward on this individual. And here we have, again, the sternum. The thymus is found directly behind the sternum. This is obviously going to be the heart. The heart is going to have the pericardial cavity surrounding it. Um, and then the, the heart and the lungs are going to work hand in hand, and we'll talk about that extensively when we get to um, the cardiovascular section and also the, um, the lung section. But basically what happens is the heart pumps, pumps deoxygenated blood to the lungs, the lungs pump oxygenated blood back, and then the heart pumps that oxygenated blood out to the rest of the body. So there's a connection between those, um, and that's going to be found right in here. This is the aorta. The aorta is going to be the region's the largest vessel. It's going to be where the blood is going to come directly out of the heart, so it's going to be found right at the top of the heart, and it's going to run from there all the way down um, through the abdominal cavity. So the abdominal aorta is going to run all the way down through the, through the base of the trunk of the body. Um, and this here, from the outside, these are going to be ribs. Right? And then this is muscle that surrounds the rib as well. Okay, so inside the abdominal cavity, we have um, the peritoneum surrounding all of the abdominal organs. The peritoneum is going to be, like as I mentioned, it's a, um, a, a membranous region that's going to cover all of the abdominal organs. Uh, we also have the visceral membrane covering the organs, and the parietal is going to line the abdominal wall. So pretty much always visceral um, outside, parietal, internal. Um, the abdominal cavity can be located, I'm sorry, divided into nine different regions, and that's going to help you locate the organs, or at least describe the location of the organs fairly easily. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about medical imaging. Again, we will talk about multiple different types of medical imaging in terms of the data that it provides, so I want to talk about what we are actually talking about when I say something like a CAT scan or an MRI. And these are all going to be different techniques that allow physicians to view images of the human body, and they all have different benefits and drawbacks. It's going to allow us to help diagnose abnormalities, right, so pathological conditions. So a very common medical procedure is going to be here. This is an x-ray, and you're going to see this a lot. The an x-ray basically is going to help show us the difference between soft and hard tissue, so the difference between bones and muscles, for example. And it's pretty inexpensive at this day and age and simple to perform. And it's going to generally going to be able to provide sufficient information. Is the bone broken, for example? Then, yes, you can tell this by x-ray. Um, but it doesn't necessarily tell you everything about soft tissue, so for that you need specialized um, types of imaging. Another type of imaging here, this is a mammogram. Mammogram is basically going to be specific to breast tissue, and you're going to be looking for the, de again, looking at density, and they'll be looking to see if there are regions that may have um, breast cancer or predisposed to breast cancer, like early, early stage breast cancers. Um, this here is a densitometry scan. This is shown a bone densitometry, and this is going to be an individual who they think might have osteoporosis, it looks like. This is looking at the lumbar spine of an individual. Another thing we might talk about is an angiogram. An angiogram is going to be looking at the blood vessels of the heart. Sometimes they'll pump this through with um, radioactive dye or some sort of labeled dye that you're able to see where things might be blocked, etc., in case of someone who may need a bypass. Um, and they would, again, compare that back to a normal heart. Here we're showing blockage in this artery. So this ought to be connected, and this highway is out. So what they're going to do is a bypass to this highway where they are going to take a vessel typically from the leg, and they're going to connect from here to here, and that's what a bypass is. There are four major ones, so if you have a quadruple Drupal bypass, that means that you've had all four of them done and you're very lucky to be alive. Um, this is just showing a single, a single blockage. Um, this is a urogram. These are showing kidney stones. This is going to be showing abnormal calcification regions. These are kidney stones that are going to have to be sonicated and then passed out through the body. Um, or if they get to be too large, they can be surgically removed as well. Um, and then this here is showing a barium contrast. 
In this case, we're looking at the colon, and here's a little cancer region. Because we have the difference, again, in uh, imaging techniques, we can see the cancer cells are going to appear different. And if we end up getting a, um, a colonoscopy and we have something that comes back abnormal, we may um, end up using this technique to detect colon cancer. Um, and a colonoscopy, anytime you see oscopy, just means uh, like a video. So it would be a video of the colon. Another thing you'll see is an MRI. We'll probably see these quite often. An MRI is going to help with, um, with soft tissue, and it's going to show fine de detail for soft tissues, but not for bones. So this would be kind of the opposite of an x-ray. But it's going to be very helpful in determining normal and abnormal tissues. So we can use it to detect tumors or fatty plaque detections or see whether or not we have issues with the brain, et cetera. So we can use it for a lot of different things. But um, but it is unfortunately going to be something you can't use if individuals have any metal in their body um, because it's magnetic and we don't want to rip the metal out of their body. So you have to be very careful with these patients and make sure that they um, are truthful about whether or not they have a little piece of shrapnel left from the war in their body. Um, on the right here we have a, a CT scan. It's a computed tomography scan. You may have heard of these before. You'll probably see several of these as well. And basically what happens is we're going to be taking um, and we're using an x-ray, but the x-ray is going in a circle around the body very quickly, and that's going to basically make little slices of the body or transverse sections. And you can see that in a video monitor, so you can go through the entire region in kind of 3D, even though you're only seeing one slice at a time. You can travel through the region and find out where the tumor begins and ends, etc. So it's a very detailed way to be able to use x-ray to get little slivers or slices of the whole body. Another thing that many people are familiar with, this is an ultrasound, and we might use an ultrasound for a pregnancy. We'll use it for other things as well, but generally that's what people use the ultrasound for is a sonogram of the fetus. Basically, we're using sound waves to reflect off of different body tissues, and then they're detected back by the instrument that sent the, the sound wave. It's high-tech sonar, essentially, and they can use it while the individual is moving, or they can take... Um, they can take videos or still footage, etc. And it's very important for monitoring during pregnancy so that you can make sure that the fetus is meeting all of the parameters that they need throughout the, um, throughout the pregnancy. Another thing you may see, this is a cardiac computed tomography angioscan. So it's basically a, um, a combination of a CT scan and an angiograph. And what you do is you put iodine in the individual, so it's going to go into their vein, um, and then they are going to use x-ray to bounce off that iodine in the vein, which is going to basically show a three-dimensional image of all of the coronary blood vessels. So not just of the heart itself, but of all the blood vessels that surround the heart. And it's generated very quickly, and they're able to determine if we have blockages. So for example, you might have a plaque blockage or calcium blockage, and that would mean that we have a region that appears to be a blood vessel, but the highway simply isn't letting blood flow through. Um, and then they're able to determine, oh, we might need to put a stent in, which is basically like a little Chinese finger trap that goes in there and pops out so that the plaque ends up pushed away so we allow blood flow through. Um, or we might end up having to actually have a bypass done. But this is a way in which we can determine what regions of the heart may be getting insufficient blood flow. Um, and here on the right, we have a PET scan, a positron admission tomography scan. Again, you'll hear it referred to as PET scan. Um, and it's going to be a way in which they are going to inject something, they're positrons, that the body is going to pick it up and put it in the tissues. And then we have a high-tech camera surrounded around the, um, surrounding the area that's going to receive the signals from those to, um, from the positrons, and that's going to construct an image, this PET scan image here, and then it basically shows where the substance is being used in the body. And so it's used for physiological purposes, so you can determine um, metabolism, for example. So you can say, see this area here demonstrates that this region of the brain is simply not using whatever it is that they've injected, right? And that's going to be a region of the area where a stroke has occurred, where the brain isn't functioning normally, where everywhere else you can see, at least on this region of the brain, that red would indicate uptake and use of the positrons. So this is used often in brain chemistry, but it can be used in other regions as well. Um, and then again, anytime you see uh, oscopy, you're going to be talking about a camera. Um, so an endoscopy is going to be any time that we are taking images inside the body with an endoscope, and we can take different re take pictures of different regions of the body. For example, um, a colonoscopy is going to go into the colon. Uh, a laparoscopy is going to be able to be used during surgery to look at all different regions. So you could use it um, to examine organs inside the abdominal pelvic, pelvic region. So you may have heard of laparoscopic surgery. Um, and then arthroscopy is used inside the interior joints, usually the knees. Um, again, another 
fantastic advancement in medical technology whereby the camera goes inside and therefore you don't have to cut the individual all the way open. You can get directly to the tear in the meniscus and sew it up without having to entirely open up the knee um, to do so. So recovery time is drastically reduced because it's just the incision in the region that they go through. So, um, so anytime you see oscopy, you're looking at an endoscopic procedure, which means that you're using a camera inside the body in a particular region. Okay, so that brings us through the end of the introduction, which is our chapter one. Um, I appreciate you sticking with me all the way to the end here, and I will talk to you very shortly about chapter two. Happy studying. Aloha.